Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I am going to talk about uh, some insights about the cost functional in weakly constrained uh, variational as, uh, assimilation. But uh, before that, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And I really say this with emphasis because I essentially invited myself to this workshop after the deadline. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, but Alberto was, uh, was uh, kind enough to give me, to give me a slot uh, here. And I have another confession to make. I'm sorry, Alberto. Um, so I'm not going to present really any original uh, results, but I would like to discuss a, a well-known mathematical result with you that I've been discussing with uh, some of the, with, with these people I mentioned here and uh, a few other people, and that gives me confidence that um, even though the result is well known, it is relevant for this community and not necessarily uh, uh, common knowledge. And I think this warrants uh, giving a talk about about this. And uh, yeah, my name is Jochen Brugge, as you can tell from this slide. So um, <clears throat> in essentially, in variational data assimilation what uh, has been very common is to minimize a functional uh, that is a combination of the observational error, roughly speaking, and the dynamical error. And with regards to the dynamical error, I think I have a point to make um, be because what is very commonly done is that some sort of energy functional is used, but I think that we have to think again whether that's actually the right functional, and I'm going to explain uh, what I see as a problem with that functional. <coughs> and. Uh, this will not be a technical talk. Uh, in fact, the main point is to explain a very technical mathematical result in non-technical terms. Nonetheless, I want to uh, introduce uh, something that is called densities in path space for SDE. So SDE stands for stochastic differential equation. So, for instance, stochastic climate models or, uh, or stochastic, uh, stochastic dynamical systems you want to use to uh, understand and predict uh, dynamical processes. Stochastic uh, differential equation. So, and I'm giving an illustrative example, and I think that uh, after this example, you agree with me that you can at least not ignore this result. You, you might in, um, decide that's irrelevant for what you want to do, but uh, I think it's very convincing that there is something wrong there. So in a typical data simulation situation, we are given a set of observations and, for instance, there can be a discrete time, eta 1 to eta n, and where the index uh, de uh, uh, represents discrete points in time, and we have a stochastic dynamical model, for instance, an SDE or a stochastic partial differential equation or something, and that is usually in continuous time, so as far as I know, weather takes place in continuous time, um, and therefore we should at least once in our life think about uh, continuous time models and how do we do data simulation in continuous time, or how we would do data simulation in continuous time. I also learned from uh, people working at operational services that are, they are increasingly interested in going for uh, very frequent um, and very small updates to their analysis, so, so like um, a number of uh, up, uh, a, a very short data simulation cycle in order to even out the computational load rather than doing it every six hours for instance and have a massive computational spike. I don't know, I'm not saying that this is sort of um, agreed policy but I hear that people in operational centers are, are at least thinking about that. So and then you also have a likelihood of observations given the states of the model so in other words this is some model of uh, the observational error or something. Um, and. Um, so a possible paradigm for variational data simulation is the following, that you find the most probable trajectory, whatever that means, this is part of, of this talk to clarify this, of the dynamical system given the observations. So um, because the point I have to make mainly concerns the dynamical error rather than the observational error, I will actually not talk about observations at all in this talk. So I will do data simulation not if I have many observations or few observations. I will do data simulation if I don't have any observations at all. Um, and still, I will show you it makes sense to look at what or to, to address the question what is the most probable trajectory of a stochastic dynamical system. 
And uh, now if you have observations, then you basically just have to go back to what you have always done, take the observation and error and add it to, your, to, your, to the cost function that we, we will be talking about in this talk. All right, so um, how do we usually obtain such a cost function? So if we start with a discrete, a model in discrete time, so like this one for instance, I have uh, xn is the state, f is the dynamics, and rn is the, uh, are some random perturbation, and in this case they are iid, normal, with mean zero and some variance gamma. So for, uh, for the sake of easy uh, illustration, this is uh, a scalar system, right? Then you can, of course, prove very simply that uh, the uh, joint density of the x1 to xn is given by this expression here, it's a Gaussian um, and you can see some form of dynamical error appearing already there, uh, xn minus f of xn minus 1. And I assume that the initial condition is fixed, so x0 is always supposed to be... Does it actually work? Well, you can faintly see this. So the initial condition is supposed to be fixed throughout this talk is equal to psi. Excuse me? Oh, yeah, if you have this fantastic green one, that would be, would be very good. I'm, I'm a little bit afraid to move uh, in... in in order not to cause a, 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 a serious feedback. Okay, thank you very much. So, on the initial condition is always uh, fixed to some number psi. Right, and a maximizer of this expression gives a most probable trajectory of the dynamics, right? And in this case, of course, the most probable trajectory is just given by xn equal to f of xn minus one, or in other words, by finding a de deterministic solution of this equation here where you just uh, uh, ignore the noise. So this is the most probable trajectory in this situation. Now, um, suppose that our model is in fact a stochastic differential equation, and I've written this here in integral form, so xt is given as initial condition plus this is the drift and this is the noise, just some Wiener process with a fixed variance or fixed intensity, I should probably say, um, and i is some finite time interval. So I'm, I'm doing this over a finite interval, um, now, how, how are we going to um, find the most probable trajectory of, of uh, a model like this, a continuous time model? Well, so here is some heuristics, and you do find this in, certain, in, in several books, claiming that this gives you the most probable trajectory, but we will see that there is a problem with that derivation. So, you, just, you can, for instance, apply an Euler scheme with a constant time step tau. This tau will... Be, uh, I will use this tau throughout the talk with the same meaning and you apply the theory from the previous slide and then you find that a most probable trajectory should be a maximizer of this functional now. Now this has stopped as well unfortunately. Anyway, um, you believe... You're not pushing the right button. Am I not pushing the right button? Well, I, pr I have probably pushed it for too long and it's... Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, thank you very much nonetheless. So. Um, you, you believe me that you get this expression here. Yeah, this is just using Euler and applying what I told you before. And, um, well, this is what you get. Right, so um, now the problem is, so it's not really a problem, but uh, the Euler scheme is, as you all know, not the only way to solve stochastic differential equations. <laughs> Right? You can do implicit schemes, for instance, and I have an implicit scheme here where I approximate the drift by, not by f of x at the previous time, uh, sorry, this is, the, this is the, the previous time, but I take the average between f at xt minus 1 and f at xtn. And of course this is an implicit scheme because in order to get the next step here, so to get xtn from xtn minus 1, you have to solve an implicit equation. But still, it's, uh, it's an absolutely valid scheme and discussed in many books and so on. Now, you do the most probable trajectory of this. And uh, after some calculations, which are not too difficult, you arrive at this expression here. So, this is something similar to what we've seen before, where now f cap is given by a slightly different expression, which you can see at the bottom of the slide. But more interestingly, we have this additional term here, this product. Right? And this product is just, simply the, is just simply coming from the transformation. No? So you have to uh, apply the transformation formula and then you get this term. So now the problem is if you send uh, tau to zero, so you assume you have an, a very fine time stepping, 
then uh, you get, depending on what scheme you are using, you get two completely different solutions. Yeah? So uh, in the first case, where we've used the Euler scheme, right, you probably already guessed what we get. We get what we all used to. So this is the energy functional. No? This is the expression you get for the Euler scheme. But if you do this same with the implicit scheme, then you get the same plus an additional term. Yeah, so you get uh, what I write here as the energy functional. This is this first part here. This is the same as above. And then you have this additional term here, right? And this term is not small or anything. It's just there and completely changes the behavior of the solution, right? Um, so, and then the question, of course, arises, which one is now right? Yeah, you can also do other implicit schemes. You remember, I just weighted the, the uh, I just took, um, my implicit scheme was just weighting the drift at the previous point and the current point sort of with a factor a half, but you can weigh these differently and that will, uh, with a different factor, and this factor will then appear here as well. So you can generate a whole spectrum of most likely paths and most, uh, and, and probability functionals, right? So what is the, what is the right density in path space and what gives us the right, uh, most probable path is completely open to discussion now. So um, in a way, the problem is that we don't have a proper definition, or I have, have not given you a proper definition of uh, density in path space. But this is not so difficult to do. So you are basically just take the motivation from the finite dimensional situation and carry this over to this infinite si uh, situation. So what you do, um, what I define to be the epsilon weight of a path, z, so z is just a function of time, right? And we want to find the density around that z. You just take the uh, probability that the solution of your stochastic differential equation is in the vicinity of z, and then you look at this for a very small epsilon, so you can also look at the picture there. So there the um, solid line is my reference pass uh, Z, and the wiggly line is the solution of the SDE. And then I'm using a epsilon neighborhood, so you can see this as a sausage around this pass Z. And you look at the probability of ending up in that sausage. And of course, if you make the sausage thinner and thinner, this probability will go to zero. So you have to rescale it properly to get a finite value. And you can rescale it with the probability that the Wiener process will be in a small sausage around zero. So I think of this usually as a Wiener sausage. So you look at a Wiener sausage around zero and you basically divide by the mass of the Wiener sausage. Okay, so and then you send epsilon to zero and you get your density in path space. But I would also like to keep the uh, dependence here of, on epsilon explicit. So this is the epsilon weight of a path. Right, and um, so now there's a, a very well-known result. This is the result I was alluding to at the beginning, that uh, if you send epsilon to zero, you get something non-trivial. You get the so-called onsager machlup functional. And the onsager machlup functional, which you can now really interpret as the density in path space, indeed is different from the energy functional. It has this term here plus uh, a half times the derivative or, in general, the divergence of the vector field as an additional, uh, additional term. And you also see that these two terms scale differently with the noise. So if you have very small noise, very small dynamical noise, then probably I would agree with you that the second term here, the divergence term, doesn't matter so much. But if the noise is large, or this is not clear from here, but I think this emerges if you do some simulation, if, you, if the trajectory is constrained a lot by observations, then it's probably also not so important to have this term. But if the constraining from the observations is not so strong, I think it's very important to keep this term in because you get quite different results. Okay, so, um, and of course, what am I doing here? So a potential uh, definition of a most probable path is, of course, then a maximizer of this, uh, of, of this expression at the top or a minimizer of this onsager machlup functional. Right. So, um, of course, you can just go and check the proof of that result and try to understand something from there. But uh, 
we would of course like to really have an intuitive understanding of what's going on. So does the Onsager Mahler functional provide most probable path consistent with our intuition? So probably if we look at this and look at solutions, we find that, well, these are not the paths that we wanted in the first place. So probably the concept of a most probable path is not what we really want. Um, this, I, I will uh, talk a bit about that. And um, I also would like to illustrate why do, does the most probable path of numerical schemes, like for instance Euler scheme, really fail to provide the most probable path of <laughs> SDEs in the limit that the step size goes to zero. So what's going wrong there, right? We know that Euler scheme or implicit scheme approximates rather well the solutions of stochastic differential equations, right? Why is it that the most probable path of the Euler scheme is a poor approximation of the most probable path of the STE proper? Yeah? So general solutions are approximated well, most probable path is not approximated well or not approximated at all, you might say. And why is that happening? Um, so here's an example, I think, that for me at least illustrated a lot what was going on. It is very, very simple. So here the drift, the drift is just the, this arc tongue. It doesn't actually matter what the drift is. What is important is that you have a sigmoid func uh, sigmoidal function that has a strong, unstable fixed point at the origin, and here is sort of asymptotically equal to minus one and one, something like that. This is the only thing that really matters. So we have this unstable fixed point, and uh, this is my drift. I just add some, some noise, and I did some simulation Euler scheme, for instance, and you get these paths here in grays. These are independent simulation of that uh, stochastic differential equation. And you can see what was going on, what's going on, it's very simple. Yeah, if you are close to the origin, close to here, so all of the paths start at zero. If you're close to this instable fixed point, of course, due to the noise, you get pushed away from the unstable fixed point very quickly. But if you are a bit further out, then you can say that the drift is actually either one if you're positive or minus one if you're negative. So if you are further away from the origin, then this behaves basically like a standard stochastic differential equation with drift either one or minus one. Okay, now what is the most probable path, right? If you take the energy functional, remember we start at zero, then we can we conclude that the most probable path is actually this dashed line here at zero. Yeah, this is the most probable path according to the energy functional, and of course this is completely wrong. Now the nothing is happening here. These there is no no there is essentially no path there. There is no mass of the STE there. Right? If you take the onsager machlob functional, then you get two solutions. You get this path here, and because you have complete symmetry, you get this path as well. And they, they are very much in regions where things are happening. Right? They seem to be much more sort of indicating where, where the stochastic differential equation sort of, you know, where the music plays, as you would say in German. So, right? so this at least convinced me that, uh, that the energy functional is not what we want. Right, so um, this is just, uh, sorry, this is just what I said. Um, so I now would like to analyze what is happening to this epsilon weight or to the weight of these sausages, right, if we use some numerical schemes, okay? So um, if I, um, what, is the, what is the mass that these numerical schemes are actually associating with a sausage around zero or a sausage around these most likely paths given by the onsager machlow functional. Right, so and I'm uh, um, saying, so I'm using this notation, so I'm using the epsilon weight and I write this as alpha of epsilon and z, so z is the reference path, epsilon is the thickness of the sausage, right, and I write this as alpha if xt is really the solution of the stochastic differential equation, but if, I'm, if it's a solution of the Euler system, then I put a little index t to indicate the time stepping of the Euler scheme, right? And I'm looking at these quantities. So, um, so this is again the um, epsilon weight for the Euler path. So if I send epsilon equal to zero, I get this. As we know, this is a simple calculation. And now if I send tau equal to zero, I get the energy functional. 
right? So what is wrong? There must be something wrong with that. Well, the calculation is right, but there must be something wrong with our interpretation of that as the correct density in path space, right? So and in fact, excuse me, and in fact, the, the, simply the mistake we make is that we interchange the limits, right? What we really want to maximize is the epsilon weight of the Euler when we first send tau to zero to get the epsilon weight of the STE and then we send epsilon equal to zero to get the density, right? Why this expression here emerges if we first send epsilon to zero and then tau and this is simply the wrong way around and the mathematics just tells us well these limits are not interchangeable we ought to do it this way around and not that way around okay that's 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 rather simply what's happening but if you have a, a problem like like that a quantity like that where you have uh, well well where the limits don't interchange then um, if you plot this for finite tau and epsilon, what you should see is some sort of crossover. Yeah? You should uh, be able to see why the limits are not interchangeable and what is happening there. So, and um, this is my last slide, but I will need to take some time to explain this plot. So, what have I done here? So, I have taken the epsilon weight of uh, Euler solutions. I have... Uh, created or, or computed that epsilon weight by just a large number of uh, Monte Carlo simulations and computed those probabilities by counting, well, simply counting how often am I in a very, very small sausage around zero, right? This is how I got the epsilon weight for a fixed thickness of the sausage and also a fixed step size of the Euler scheme. Right, so... Um, now, on the y-axis is this weight, and on the x-axis I have essentially the thickness of that sausage, right? And then we can look at only one line. Let's start with only one line first. So we look at the solid line with uh, this uh, nabla kind of symbol here. So the solid line is for an interval, time interval, between 0 and 0 0.2. This is my total simulation interval. And also the time stepping was 10 to the minus 6, I think, no? Yeah, so a very fine time stepping, 10 to the minus 6. Okay, what do we see? So remember that this is the thickness of the sausage and basically, uh, I probably should have plotted this the other way around, but what's happening here is that if I go from right to left, then the sausage becomes thinner and thinner. Yeah? Remember, I rescaled this with this uh, Wiener sausage, right? So, what's happening is that if I start here and make the sausage thinner, then this weight goes down, and it seems to be settling on a sort of plateau. Okay? So, this, the value of the epsilon weight at that plateau is what it should be, because you can compute that the onsager machlup functional is exact, ha, does exactly have that value of this plateau. So the, um, it's, down, it's down here. I don't know if you can actually see this. So for the value of the onsager machlup functional, or rather expo exp exponential of minus the onsager machlup functional, for this particular trajectory is 0 0.68. And uh, that should be the asymptotic uh, value of the epsilon weight. And you can see, I hope you can see this, that this is precisely the value of that plateau. So if I send the, if I make the sausage thinner and thinner, then even for the Euler scheme, I'm reaching that plateau for a while. And then if I make epsilon even smaller, it goes up. Something bad happens. I, uh, here is exactly the crossover. And I go to the value one, which is the value for the energy functional. Yeah? So it seems to be going in the right direction, but then if epsilon is too small, if the sausage is too thin, I go to the wrong value. I, see, I start seeing the energy functional. And this is es essentially, you see the same behavior uh, for different time stepping and different lengths of the simulation interval. Um, so you, you can now wonder why is this? So when, when does this uh, crossover happen? You can see that this crossover happens. This is, you can tell this from that plot. 
Um, so if you apply an Euler scheme, then the stochastic perturbations you are adding to the right hand side, they have a certain characteristic magnitude. The magnitude is the intensity rho times under root the length of the time interval. This is the standard deviation of the random variable you add on the right hand side. They have a characteristic magnitude. If the width of that sausage right, is of the same order, is precisely at that point where this crossover happens, right? Then the dynamics, then the, you know, the sausage starts to feel that this is really a discrete scheme and not a continuous simulation of your SDE proper, right? This is precisely where this crossover happens and you can tell from this plot that this holds. If you have a smaller, if you have, sorry, if you have longer time steps, then these perturbations are larger. You are using larger perturbations and this happens earlier, right? Even so, if you have a bigger sausage, then at some point it starts to feel that you are walking in discrete steps, basically, rather than doing a completely continuous simulation of your STE. Or in other words, if you are, in other words, the onsager machlup functional is right, if you make sure that the perturbations you add to your STE are always smaller or much smaller than the width of your sausage. Right? So in a continuous time model, that would be basically the case by definition. And this is why, the, why I think onsager machlup functional is the right thing. Okay, so um, this is my, here's my conclusion. It's very brief. If we adopt the paradigm of finding the most probable path trajectory for variational assimilation, then we need to keep in mind that the most probable trajectory of an approximation to the STE does not necessarily approximate the most probable path of the STE itself, right? Um, I hope I convinced you of that fact. And the most probable trajectory of an STE uh, minimizes the ansager machlup functional, which is not the same as the energy functional, except for, of course, in, in, in special cases, right? If in a multidimensional situation the divergence vanishes of your vector field, then the, the two are the same. And uh, consequently, to approximate the most probable trajectory of an STE, do not approximate the STE. Rather, you should approximate a minimizer of the onsager machlup functional. Right? So don't approximate the STE and find the most probable path. Try to find the most probable path of your STE by minimizing this functional to begin with. Thank you very much. That's all I have to say. Very nice presentation, uh, Jochen. So, questions, remarks on this? Let's first. So, uh, for, forgive my ignorance, but I mean, the, the difference between the two functionals you're talking about reminds me uh, at, at superficial level of you know, Stratovich versus Ito calculus. I mean, can you comment? Is there any connection? So, um, w well, this term, you, so if you derive this properly, then one way to prove it is to go to Svatonovich calculus, and then it is true a term appears that will then survive and show up in the, in the onsager machlow functional. But the connection is, is, um, is quite difficult. I mean, this is, there's no direct connection. Okay. I should say, all the results I've presented here are for constant noise intensity. If you have state-dependent noise intensity, you know what I mean, if you have multiplicative noise, then this onsager machlow functional becomes even more complicated. Right? You have terms related to the curvature of... Well, I'll leave it with that, yeah? Right, so... If I understand correctly, you can balance out the thickness of the sausage with the uh, value of the partition and then get the right answer. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. So what is the balancing? So the balancing is that um, the width of the sausage always has to be larger than the typical size of the perturbation you add to the right hand side. So if, if in an Euler scheme, mm -hmm. right. you add... Can, can you go back to those slides? Yeah, probably I can go back. Well, you mean the, the where I show the the graph, or where I show the different? No, when you show the first time the Before that. Okay. So how? 
Not here. Next one. No, no. Uh, it depends on what the question is. So um, this one. Oh, yeah. So well, let me first try and answer Dan's question. So if you, um, uh, if if you, if you have an SDE like this now, dx equals f of x uh, dt plus rho times dw, then uh, if you do an Euler scheme, you add random variables of the order of standard deviation rho times under root tau in my notation, right? Yeah, and. Uh, this number, so the typical size of the perturbations you add, has to be smaller than the width of the sausage. Then the sausage will give you, will, 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 give, will have the, the, approximately the right mass. I would have thought this must be a balancing. I mean, you know, if it's too small, I, I assume, okay, I understand. Yeah, if the, if the sausage is too large, then you are not approximating the density anyway, yeah? Because the density is, is in the limit that that you know the rel that the, you have the the density is the relative mass in a very very small bowl in that banner space. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so this must have relevance if you want to try to do uh, continuous time variational data simulation. This balancing. Well, for what? I, I, I'm not trying to present sure. I'm because you know, if you do it, you know, in a in a in a way that doesn't take into account this balancing, then you yeah. obtain the wrong answer. Yeah, I think so. I, well, that's sort of my point. I think you get the right answer automatically if you use the onsaga machlo functional uh, from the very beginning to to minimize your to find your solution. Probably you mean something different. I mean, you know, I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, it reminds me. I think that I've seen this in some papers by Greg Eink. It's absolutely possible. Yeah, I'm saying... Uh, I, mean, I mean, apply to data simulation. You know, uh, right. he, uh, he thought he was going to revolutionize data simulation by bringing in on saga something action. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I can't remember whether this was JSP or... But later, the, there were some joint papers by Greg Eink and Juan Restrepo on the same theme. So uh, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, Onsaga was there. <laughs> I can't right. remember Mahlu because I didn't know him. I should, okay, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm not claiming that this is not known. I'm not claiming that this is my result at all. I'm just saying that I have the feeling that uh, you know not everyone knows about this, and probably it is useful what I'm doing here. I hope I just I just hope that. Okay, thank you very much, Johan. Thank you again. And, uh, let's move to the last talk of the session.